episode of the Social Equity Committee. Uh, so first of all, uh, we did receive a couple of public comments. So there's a pretty comprehensive public comment here uh, submitted by the uh, Cannabis Equity Coalition. There's the link on that slide. It's a 31-page document. It encompasses uh, topics including social equity as well as some other um, in the larger scheme of the cannabis regulatory system that uh, that is there. Also, a member of that coalition supporter support of this one. I just want to encourage members of the public to chime in and uh, express your feelings and thoughts about the upcoming adult use Vermont cannabis program. And there's a link to where to submit your public comments to. Uh, so if there's no further questions, please, uh, I'd like to turn this over to Gina. Oh yeah, also, we need a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. So may I have a motion? Motion. Thank you, Ashley. A second, please. Second. All right, the meetings from October 14th are approved. And with that, please welcome Dina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that great introduction and um, getting us off to a good start. One of the things I thought we should really start with is what should be in a social equity application. Um, and then we'll go forward into, you know, who should be in charge of that and then some of the roles and responsibilities of the social equity board so that we have a better understanding of who we really want on the board uh, by determining what they should be covering. So the application should include, but not limited to the following, and this is all of the stuff that we have discussed over the past few weeks that we really wanted to see from applicants, which is the proof of residency, um, a proof of court documents, probationary documents, um, to show if one was incarcerated, if they are going towards that one section, um, or proof of their family member being um, convicted, um, incorporation documents, so showing that the business that they will be starting, that they have ownership in it, and a description of what their role and responsibility will be in the company. As we have agreed to, we wanted to show that they had our responsibility and duties on a daily basis. Um, if, um, if they are going to be on the rest, race, ethnicity, identity, so indicating that on the application. Um, and many of you wanted to know how they were harmed on the war on drugs to kind of share their story and number of years residing in Vermont. Is everybody okay with that? It's just the starting basis. Um, it will not just be limited to this. Julio? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. Ashley? Um, I think it's fine. I know that, of course, municipalities continue to be a hot button, and I just want to be sure, you know, that we get as many things, or as many ducks in a row as possible before any applicant applies. So perhaps in that incorporation documents, including articles, bylaws, and operating agreements showing ownership, you know, have they reached out to the municipalities? Do they, you know, depending on if it's cultivating, you know, do they have ideas of how they're going to be affecting their municipalities? I just, I know we're not going to drill down too much, but um, I want to make sure that we include those. Um, I think that it should be included in their. Um, application for a license itself. This is just an application for them to be able to submit their application as a, a social equity cabinet. Got it. Are you okay with the separation of the two? Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Susanna, how do you feel? I'm okay with it. Okay, great. So just for the record, we are okay in that uh, a social equity application needs to make sure to incorporate at least the following documents. Okay, so as we talked about the application, who should be in charge of approving a social equity application? Should it be the Cannabis Control Board? Should it be the new Cannabis Social Equity Board that we have been discussing last week? Or should it be a combination of both? Your thoughts? Um, 
I mean, I'm thinking practically, and then I'm thinking, you know, sort of, you know, philosophically in the sense that, you know, it'd be great for recommendation three. Um, there's just going to be so much to go through that I'm, I'm wondering if there's some way for the social equity board to, you know, start the process, and then when there's a, you know, a collection of candidates that meet applications and those are submitted to the cannabis control board. I guess what I'm trying to specify is fielding through applications is kind of one subset and then you know approval from there is another subset if that makes sense. Um, so I think a combo would be great first starting with the cannabis social equity board and then moving on to do the cannabis control board. Um, What, can you explain further what you would like the Cannabis Social Equity Board to be in charge of? Um, and just making sure that all of the documentation is there. And right. then once it did that, it has happened. And if it isn't for one way, for one reason or another, that that's remediated before going up in front of the Cannabis Control Board for approval. Okay, so helping or assisting one with their application, making sure it's complete, and then moving it to the other. That, that's, a, that's a great recommendation. Um, one thing I do want to know, uh, I know what some of our social equity representatives, one of them was a licensed cannabis social equity, um, three of the representatives. So we may have to start out with looking at the licensees without those people, or Maybe we do potential licensee holders um, if we're going to try to get members. I, I know that there was a strong contention of that on that meeting that they need to be social equity representatives. I'm just putting that out there. Um, Julio, your thoughts? Uh, I think it has. I mean, I think. <clears throat> Ultimately, I think the decision has to come under the statute from the Cannabis Control Board. Um, and so I think recommendation three is the way to go here. Um, uh, I don't know that, I mean, a recommendation three doesn't say whether everybody's voting on it together or whether it comes from the the equity board and then goes to the three members. Uh, and I'm not sure it really makes that big of a difference, but I think, I mean, uh, to me, the, I'm, I'm, I think the only realistic options would be recommendation one or three. I don't know how, under the existing statute, you could leave the CCB out of the approval process. So I, I would go for three. And this is just the social equity application. It is not the licensee application, Leo. Uh, uh, I, I, are they entitled to this benefit? Um, one of the questions, are you in agreement with sort of athletes um, standpoint where the Canada Social Equity Board um, reviews the application just to make sure that it's you know, if the person needs assistance that they receive it and that the application is completed with all the necessary documentation and then forward it to the Cannabis Control Board uh, for final decision making, um, which will reduce the Cannabis Control Board's um, efforts if there is not, if there is any documentation that has been left out. I think, and it, a different way of phrasing what you, you just said is that the Cannabis Control Board would review all or have review access to all applications that are completed, but not all submissions as, as that might be received, and then thus wouldn't be involved in that process. I, I think that's I think that's fine. Great. Is that any your thoughts? Another body that's, you know, maybe has a more diverse makeup of people and a better, more broader perspective on social equity. Thank you, Julie. And Ashley, I saw your hand raised. 
Well, I'm curious, just kind of thinking sequentially how this can, can go, um, if it is up to the social equity board, um, is that also going to be a time when like the application for intent is going to happen? Like I see some a, a symbiosis happening there where, you know, let's say two or three years from now, there's social equity applicants coming in to apply just as at the applicant, but the board can be like, well, we still need a lot of delivery drivers or we still need a lot of cultivators. And that would be a great letter or a great application for intent to go go with. I mean, we're waiving all these fees anyway, so I feel like that makes it a lot easier in, in and of itself. But I feel like there could be a lot more of the board, of the social equity board, um, to really help steer these applicants in, into the right direction as far as where the need is for the industry. Yeah, I, that that would be a great um, responsibility for them. Um, so I think that still coincides with sort of recommendation three and with your revisions on top of it, which is the cannabis social equity board is the first to review application in its entirety. Um, once an application is um, complete, it then goes through the cannabis control board. Um, who, Julia, would you like to make any revisions to that to that statement? No. Um, can we um, make a vote to make a recommendation that both the Cannabis Control Board and the Cannabis Social Equity Board are um, work with reviewing the application. It first goes to the Cannabis Control uh, Cannabis Social Equity Board to be reviewed um, and ensure that all the documentation is completed and then goes on for um, final approval to the Cannabis Control Board. Ashley? Uh, yes, the recommendation is great. Julio? Second that, yeah. Thank you. Please note for the record, two yeses on recommendation three with the agenda. Social equity board responsibilities. What would we like? Um, them to be in charge of. So we already approved um, social equity candidates, um, which is the last bullet point there. And we will provide that to say, you know, helping them completing their application and ensuring our documentation is included and um, what license they are applying for is completely understood. Um, another one, we have just some examples that we can discuss is um, aid in ensuring funding for the program, you know, looking out for grants, donations that can be adjusted. I know we have spoken about creating um, a social equity grant fund um, to, to allow for, a trust fund to allow for donations to be given. Um, also, aid in the development and deployment of a social equity educational program. So they don't have to create, do it themselves, but you know, formulate a program. What educational workshops are needed by social equity candidates? What would be beneficial to them? Um, overseeing funding of to programs or initiatives to candidates, um, and overseeing the cannabis disproportionately impacted community funds, which I've discussed with you about creating, which would be giving tax cannabis tax funds back to those communities that have been disproportionately impacted on the war on cannabis. Julio, your thoughts? Um, I like, I, I think the, the bullets that are on the screen are good um, points. In, in the second bullet point, when it talks about the development and deployment, I think um maybe it's a sub it's a sub section of that area of assistance where i think the board could have a role in educating communities about the program uh and about the social you know the social equity aspects of it um so that if, if there is any community concern or opposition 
to operations in their county or, or town that are, that's based on a lack of knowledge about the program uh, or assumptions about how the program actually operates and who benefits in the short and long term. Um, I think the Social Equity Board uh, might have a hand in, in providing some of that education. I think it will be a collective education effort, but it seems to me that uh, some or all of the Social Equity Board um, could um, could um, help pitch in, in that role um, because they will have a lot more direct involvement in how the program is running um, for the social equity uh, part of the market and um, what the experiences are being reported back um, from, from folks who are participating in the program. Yeah, that's a great addition. Can we um, so summarize that as marketing of the social equity program? I, I, I would put it more in the realm of education and community outreach. Um, community outreach, okay. But I think there'll be separate marketing that will be going on, which, we, which will get more the classic, you know, understanding of marketing when you were talking about commercial marketing, because I, I think communities will still have to make those decisions, but I think um, making the most informed decisions and getting to a point where they can make those informed and fair, and fair decisions is, uh, would be a role for you know a, a board like the SE board. Wonderful. Okay, so I'll have that down as education and community outreach about the program. Okay. Okay. And Ashley, how do you feel about these bullet points and then adding um, education and community outreach about the program, about social equity program? I think all this is a good start. And yes, I do like that addition. Um, I mean, of course, I'm hoping for um, a diverse, just, and equitable, fair industry. Um, with lots of social equity um, licensees. One thing I brought up, and it feels like this is like a full circle moment from the very first time we all met, was understanding that you know we create this environment where we don't want to see discrimination, but what happens when that does occur? Um, is the social equity board then going to more or less like represent that individual or corporation or? Um, I, I think it was um, maybe Ben brought it up about um, us, we applicants, I want to say it was in Chicago, Illinois, um, who had spent all this money and uh, on the application process and had secured a space and was still waiting and or was denied um, a license. And so I'm curious when that occurs, where does the social equity board step in um, to advocate for that individual or, uh, yeah, um, would, would that be under their responsibilities? Um, I guess I'm just kind of trying to start a dialogue on that. Um, I think that if there were any comments of discrimination, it should be board to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. And then if they thought that it needed to be addressed through the social equity board, um, because then it would be a violation. So in Illinois, there have been a couple of problems. So they, um, I believe that the case that we're speaking about is based on merits and point system. So, um, so they had to have a number of points in their application, and then they have to spend all this money creating a proposal uh, for that application to be recognized. And then um, in Illinois, they've also then changed the lottery system. Um, so it's much more, tell me about your story, and we'll see if we're accept you, where here is a little more clear cut if people are, you know, meet those two point either you know you represent uh, you are from a BIPOC community or you have been you know harmed by the war on drugs by being um, incarcerated 
So I think it, it's a little different. But I think it would be best with Jeffrey if you want to go into it. I'm not exactly sure of the case that um, Ben has identified. But those cases do have, have existed in Illinois with the changes in their social equity program. Yeah, yeah, I think that's question. So, as far as appeals, you know, like Ashley, you're talking about an, an appeals process. Yeah. So that, that is outlined in Act 164 of how appeals are handled, and it goes directly to the um, executive director of the CCD. So, the you know, SC board maybe they may not have anything to do that at all. Um, as far as the uh, you know, Illinois case, that was, um, that the main part that case was the, the um, the criteria was changed in the middle of the process, and that was what derailed the whole thing. That's why the, the plaintiff was like, hey, you know, I, I thought I applied under, under what I was supposed to do, and then the, the ground shifted underneath the plaintiff, and they had to fly. Another one is another representative from a disproportionately impacted community. 
this one who is really experienced in community development, as that's what we want to make sure and try, try to do. A person arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis release offense. A family member of someone arrested, convicted, or incarcerated for a cannabis release offense. A social worker from a disproportionately impacted community. Um, an educator from disproportionately impacted communities. A business owner from a disproportionately impacted community. Um, a licensed social equity candidate who represents um, the retail, one from the retail area, one from the processor sector, and the cultivator sector. All of these people should be social equity candidates. Next, we wanted a licensed non-social equity cannabis uh, representative, someone from the Department of Racial Equity and Diversity, a person from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and then a member of the Social Equity Caucus, and a member of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, so note that we have spoken about is that at least 50% of representatives come from um, cannabis in impacted groups, 25 from the cannabis industry representatives, 25% from state representatives. We should have an odd number of people, possibly 15, and they need to be geographically diverse is preferred. Um, I think we have lost Ashley, but Julio, how do you feel about this updated list? Um, I guess. So. Any added addition? Alicia? Well, I mean, the question is really for me is, I mean, with, with a follow up to your last comment about having a further definition of what a representative from a disproportionately impacted community is, because I think we want that to reflect the. Uh, uh, representation or advocacy on behalf of um, uh, communities uh, or individuals who are, have been uh, historically marginalized in the state of Vermont that's racially diverse and so forth. I, in our last meeting, I had pulled language, I think, from, uh, uh, you know, one of one from statutes that, um, that, that ensures that you know that racial and uh, and uh, uh, community diversity factor isn't overlooked. Um, so that's that's really where I'm zeroing in on because if you um, if you're going to say it's a representative of a community, that's really like a geographic qualification, and um, to me that wouldn't be enough that you would want to um, see, you know, see people who, who are within that community but also have that further either experience or background um, uh, in that community. So that, that would be my only question about how that is itself defined. Because I think just saying you're from the city, you could be anybody like, like the mayor of the city who's lived, uh, you know, or the old, you know, the uh, the only banker in the city. Um, that wouldn't be somebody I would consider to be what's behind the spirit of um, these recommendations. So, what would you like the representative um, definition to be? So, you want someone who's re who resides or has resided in yeah, I, um, I'm, here? I don't know if you have access to the chat from the last um, session um, we had. I'm trying to look at that because I I provided. Um, drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state who have experience working to implement and implement racial justice reform. That was he took it from three VSA section one six eight. Right, I don't know that it has to be specific involvement in racial, you know, working in racial justice reform, but involved in it, I think. So unfortunately, so, to access it before, um, 
I was, so I know. Oh yeah, I have it right here. So I think we should say that it is to be diverse, drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state. Um, and I, and I think that should be the overarching. You, you want to expand? I want to, yeah, I want to, I would expand that to communities of color um, and other marginalized individuals because um, we have some new Vermonters uh, who have come to us from other countries who um, may have been, may have found themselves, uh, you know, facing challenges as they try to integrate in the U.S. and it may not be their color per se, but maybe their nation of origin that um, has put them, you know, in uh, either a marginalized or, um, you know, victimized position in the state. So I would want to have it a little bit broader than that because there's, um, there, you know, those those experiences are are, are very uh, similar, and you would again part of that language is to get diverse backgrounds, and um, and that's the uh, you know the immigrant community in Vermont um, I think does offer a, an additional valuable perspective here. Uh, definitely. So, Julio, um, if we say members should be drawn from diverse backgrounds and geographical locations to represent the interests of communities of color and other marginalized groups throughout the state of Vermont. Yeah. Okay. We're on that. Um, yeah. You did uh, the much heading. Yeah. I just. Um, I just and paste some of what you wrote there. Um, so I was just, we're at that, but what do you want from the representative? Because I just want to make really sure that when we talk about the representative from disproportionately impacted communities, do they have to have lived in that community or are currently living in that community? Well, that's what I understood up front to mean, that, yeah, that they are, yeah. that, that they are, that they're living there. Currently residing? Yes, not people who lived there 20 years ago and have, you know, moved to Wall Street and their Park Avenue or so, so forth, yeah. So representative from these disproportionately impacted areas need to be currently living there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there's- These were there for the past year or two. No, I would want people who are in those communities. Right. That's, that's what I favored and that's what I thought was being recommended. I think there are two dimensions of that. One is to get feedback on folks from that community who may be entering the market or participating in the market. And then the other side of it, as the program starts to grow, hopefully we'll have feedback from them as to how revenues raised from the, the market is affecting their community. Is it going in the right place or is it uh, and, and if there's money that's being uh, reinvested in, in uh, those communities, is it, uh, you know, what is the, the, the pipeline there? I, I just think they have a real valuable, you know, personal connection to um, that, I mean, like kind of the street experience uh, on, on the block or on Main Street as to, you know, what what investments are, are, are um, are worthwhile continuing to support and which ones might not be that might not be the, the right ones and so I mean, having kind of ears on the ground to use a better metaphor maybe because I think it's really really valuable yeah that's a great point um one of the things though when we say representative we want them to currently be living residing in these areas um for the social worker and the educator I want to say that the social worker is working for those disproportionately yeah. impacted communities and the educator for, I don't want them to have to reside there. So those yeah, are only two caveats, yeah. Okay. I mean, that might be a preference selection if they're actually from the committee, but I don't think it has to be a requirement. Um, but, okay. you know, uh, but certainly that they work in those communities so that they, again, I think they have, you know, somewhat different, but very, um, 
at least the possibility of very tangible uh, feedback to get from those communities that they're working in day to day. So I think that's, that's right. Thank you, Julio. Um, we're going to break for public comments and then hopefully come back to this topic and do something today. Um, any public comments? Do you have any public comments today? Public comments? None today, you know. Well, thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to this discussion. Ashley, how do you feel about that? Um, do I have that overarching um, statement? And then, um, including that representatives currently reside in those communities. Um, I'm with you, Gina. I don't think that they should have to necessarily reside in those. And I also wanted to perhaps shorten one of the definitions for the licensed social equity cannabis representative and they accept that not for makeup process or cultivator or include delivery um as part of that requirement so that okay we can we can adding okay um i don't know do you want to be on two my difficulties here i'm going to turn off my stuff and put it in the chat if you can hear me Okay, I can hear you, but if you're having, yeah, okay, turn that off. Susanna, what are, what are your feelings? And then we're going to go back to Ashley in a moment. Yes, I, um, I agree with you about wanting to make sure that, um, you know, people from the community or who, you know, like the geographic diversity and that point that you were making. And um, I think that when it comes to the people like educator and social worker, I agree with also not requiring them to live in, but to serve the community. And I actually had a question because we're thinking about what the person lives in the community currently or used to, and I'm cool with um, I'm cool with making it currently live. Although I know there's yeah, I'm cool with that. But I wonder should we be thinking about housing instability is that going to be enough of a factor i mean i don't know i don't know a whole lot of people who are housing unstable who are who also have the seed capital to start this kind of business in the first place but just in terms of proving residency i don't know we may want to think about it um one of the things that we also are trying to do is to get them entry into the industry so it's not these um those who will have been disproportionately impacted doesn't necessarily mean that they're licensee holders. We made sure to add those on the licensed social equity portion um, because you know these representatives can also um, be helping towards what programs that they would want to see in order to be educated to be able to enter successfully enter the industry. Do you have any additional um, thoughts on that, Susanna? On the piece you just said or just on the topic as a whole? Um, from the re representatives from disproportionately impacted communities. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with what we've left out so far. Great, thank you. And Ashley, are you there now? I, I hope so. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> Jeez. I have three different internet. I can hear you. Um, so I put in the chat just my um, addition to perhaps shortening the definition of a licensed social equity cannabis representative and just leaving it at that for making sure that we're also including, I mean, we, we will, but including all the different um, facets of the supply chain, so not just to retail process or cultivator, but also um, delivery. And then I, I'm sorry, but I don't know what a social equity caucus is. Oh, um, I think that, uh, that's from the, the legislation. So the Vermont legislators, the representatives from the government um, have a social equity caucus, so, uh, a subcommittee group within the Vermont legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna, for that. 
And so I thought cool. this is a comprehensive list. Um, but again, like I, I feel like I need a little bit more time, and I know we're running out of time here to review this and make sure that we're we're hitting all on all the facts we need to. Yeah, I think this is a good point. Um, if we take out, if we just say it's a licensed social equity cannabis representative, and they can be from any sector of the industry, that would bring us down to 13 members instead of 15. Um, are you okay with going down to 13 members? And having only one social equity cannabis representative? I'm from the license. I mean, I feel more representation is better. Um, I, I would like to see there be more social equity cannabis representatives. I mean, this is the, this is for them by them. I feel like it seems odd just to have one. Um, but again, I, I I don't know that I that I know what's best either here. Leo? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, how did we get from 15 to 13 again? I'm sorry, I missed that part. Um, Ashley recommended the possibility of only having one licensed social equity cannabis representative instead of having it from retail processor or cultivator, or if we were going to have it from those three sectors we wanted to add delivery which i think is really important and i on top of that would add co-op as well or any other special licenses that we have spoken about um which would then bring it up to 70 members so do we want to add to to make sure that every social equity cannabis sector is um represented that being said, there could be someone who is completely integrated, so they are dealing with retail processing, cultivating as well. Um, but we do not know what our cannabis um, social equity pool will look like. Um, how do you feel about adding two more members or creating only one membership for the licensed social equity? Cannabis representative. So it's bullet points down. So going so now instead of talking about fifteen to thirteen, we're talking about fifteen to seventeen. Is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, I know I some concerns about unwieldiness for that size of body. It's something that Susanna brought up last time. Fifteen to me seems like um, you know, on the larger end. Uh, I don't know that, I mean, I think that as this board functions, there's no question that, to me, that folks who either work in the market or want to work in the market with or without um, the social equity benefits that are provided so the board is going to hear from people in delivery, in cultivation, and processing. So it's not clear to me that um, you need those additional licensed representatives for each subsector for the board to be responsive to the market. I think that the challenge when you introduce any member of a board who's a participant in the market is that other members may be discounting their viewpoints in part because they may be beneficiaries of what they're advocating. Um, whereas, because they may have a direct financial interest in what's being supported or opposed, which the other members, will, it'll be much more direct, indirect interest in it. Um, and so, um, and so that's my concern about increasing the number of representatives who are license holders and thus market participants and potential beneficiaries, potential winners or losers, uh, in, to put it in a stark way. Um, yeah. so that would be the, 
if we were going to in increase representation um, from the, the communities that really this part of the program is directed to, it, it wouldn't be through the licensed individuals for me. Um, I think having some representation that you we have two, um, I think is is sufficient for me. Um, so I, I would be I would be more inclined if, if the tide were moving to push to 17, which in my view is too large. I, I would be moving for additional representatives from the communities who are not license holders. Um, I that, would, that's my reaction to that. One of the uh, positions we don't have on here that I just realized is having a social equity candidate who is not a licensee. So, you know, how they feel about education, you know, where, how, are, how are they doing in the industry themselves? So I think, um, do we want to maybe adjust this to say two licensed social equity cannabis representatives from any sector of the industry and then adding um, one social equity candidate um, who is going through either the educational program or in, in the industry to, to just widen the perspective because we have a lot of candidate perspectives from the industry but uh, as a licensee but not uh, to the other groups that we're trying to to represent as well. Julio? Um, my reaction to uh, the first proposal which is just to say a licensed representative I, I think it's fine because um, I'm not sure we know enough to know which sector would be the better sector and a person might have multiple licenses. As for the second, the applicant, I still, adding an applicant representative, I think for me presents two issues and maybe we can resolve them, but the first is that your status as an applicant may be temporary. You may. You may be appointed when you're an applicant uh, and then you become a license holder and now are you removed from the board because there's only room for one social equity license holder and now we have two uh, or and, and then the second thing i think is again there's that potential conflict of interest issue because the applicant may be a direct beneficiary of whatever the board is voting for and in theory, there could be some decisions, including decisions on applications from which they would have to be recused. Um, and other people, I mean, where they're, it's a competitive market. So it's not, we're not running a utility here. So everyone who has a license uh, for a given sector could well be a competitor. And that's, that's my concern about adding the applicant so I find that, that if one licensed social equity representative and one non-social equity representative full stop that's that's where I am um, and and so what I just want to clear is that it's a social equity rep candidate that works in the cannabis sector so they got they went through the educational programming and now they have a job you know, to really say, you know, were these educational programs beneficial? Do we need to make some changes? You know, we, we definitely need someone who is going to give us feedback about the program as well and who can speak for that on the committee. But we need to end it for today. I would love to continue this for another hour. Um, Ashley, I did see your hand raised if you want to send me an email. Um, we're going to go back to the drawing board of, about this, but we're going to it's going to be great um and in just my final announcement to everybody and especially the public if you're hearing this you know please as we said on our last call this is step one of the social equity program um the second step is when we come and we meet you so we hear your stories we hear what you would like from a social equity program and then the third step is to give all the recommendations from the subcommittee and from uh, the public to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board to make a final decisions of what this program will look like. So please look for me. We'll be sending stuff out by the end of October to talk about two days where we'll have town halls that you can meet us 
on, you know, virtually, and we can hear from you. And we will remain quiet so that you can speak. Uh, so I'm truly excited to have the second part of it. It's always a joy to hear your stories and to tell us how we can best serve you. Um, so thank you, everyone. Can I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? Motion. Second. Thank you so much. And I will see you on Thursday and find some new slides and some new stuff that we can talk about. Bye.